Good morning, it's Larry Stovall, and I'm with uh, Heartland Baptist Church. Uh, this is the Ambassador Sunday School class, uh, and uh, for the next installment of our study through the book of Hebrews. Today we're in Hebrews chapter 12, and uh, we're looking forward to, uh, to the, the next installment will be the final chapter, which is kind of the salutation of the book. And so what we have is today, is the is the summary after we studied the uh, the book of faith which was hebrews 11 the last time so again as a recount and as kind of a review of the of the book of hebrews i know that you some of you may get tired of this but it kind of helps me to focus in on where it was while you may be watching these uh in close succession uh, it's been it's been several days since we re last recorded, so it's always nice to be able to go back and kind of reset my memory as well. The book of Hebrews, of course, is written by a person who is unknown. Uh, I, as a personal belief, and have no way of, of of telling and knowing for sure, but I believe that it was written by the Apostle Paul. It was, we do not know the exact time that it was written, but we do know that it was written after the, because uh, in the next chapter, chapter 13, it mentions Timothy. And so we know that Timothy, of course, came on the scene in 53 AD. And then of course, the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD was completely destroyed. And so neither, so we know about Timothy in chapter 13, but the destruction of Israel is ignored, which would not have been in the book of Hebrews. In so we know that it's around 52, between 53 and 70 AD, somewhere in that range. We look here and it's written primarily to the Jews uh, because the Jews and the church were being persecuted and the church was being persecuted. And so a lot of the Jews uh, were losing since the church was 25, 30 years old at this particular time, maybe a little bit more. Uh, the Jews were getting a little bit uh, antsy about staying there. I think the new had worn off and so many of them were making the decision to go back. And so the, the persecution I think is pretty much mentioned uh, all throughout the book and because the Jews were leaving, uh, but I think there were some other things involved, prejudice against the Jewish uh, brethren was what the Gentile brethren was one thing that was a real problem. Uh, they had lived apart from Jews and Gentiles had lived apart all these different years. And now all of a sudden they're stuck in the same church with them. And so therefore what we, we see that I think there's a little bit of prejudice that is in every human being. And so we see that today. We also see that there was a passion probably for their previous culture. Uh, people who grow up a certain way, if they lose that, they tend to uh, they tend to to miss it, and so therefore there was a there was a a way to, there was a tendency for them to go back to their childhood uh, religion, and so because of a lot of different things of economic reasons, etc., it was a lot easier for the Jews just to go back and slide into their old life and and to deny the church. Now the apostle or the writer of the book of Hebrews, which we have said, I think was the apostle Paul, was concerned about this. And so what they was doing, the writer of the book of Hebrews was writing to them saying, look, don't, don't miss this opportunity. Don't miss this occasion because the church is the next part of Jesus's, uh, of, Jesus's uh, uh, of God's dealing with the earth. The church is the next step. And so that the church literally has, has, uh, has replaced the law and the prophets. Now, uh, I've also been reading and looking at some, several different things. And so, but we've got to be careful here because the, because the law and the prophets were replaced by Jesus does not mean that God is through with the, with the church with, or through with the, with the Jewish nation. We know that, of course, in the end times, uh, we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. We believe that the church will be taken out away and God will uh, again reestablish his relationship with the Jews. And that for this reason, they've been uh, preserved all down through the ages. And the promises of Abraham have not been all fulfilled. 
We know that Jesus is a partial fulfillment. We know that Jesus fulfilled the law. He fulfilled uh, the, the sacrifices. He fulfilled all of these different things, but what he did not do, he did not replace the role of the Jewish people in the end times. So we gotta be careful that when we see this, what I'm saying by teaching in Hebrews is that God did not replace the nation of Israel. He did, however, replace the, the worship services of the Jewish nation with, uh, with the church. Now, of course, when the end times come, then the Holy Spirit will be withdrawn and with it will go the church. And so things will go back into the Old Testament era and God and the Jews, of course, will embrace Christ as the Jewish Messiah, and then the world stage will, will come to a close. But this is a, a little beyond the scope of this particular book. It's just a caution that we need to keep in mind. First of all, we know that the, in chapter one, that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. He is the completion of, the, of God's revelation. And so therefore he is the Jewish Messiah that the Jew sent to the Jews. His initial mission was to the Jews and they were to accept him and they were to embrace him, which they did not. And when they did not, then of course, uh, it moved on to the church, but Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. And then it continues in chapter two, warning that not to miss the salvation of Christ. His, this, the notable verse in that particular chapter, I'm paraphrasing here, how should we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And so we see here that, that, uh, that uh, uh, he is a continuation of this. And a, a great warning, chapter three, he says that Christ is superior to Moses and the law, which of course would not be accepted by Jews today, Orthodox Jews, uh, as it was not in those days. But he said that Christ was superior to the law. And so he was superior to the Aaronic priesthood. And so he was the, the, the tribe of Levi, of course, were the, was the, the, the tribe of the priesthood. And so when the Aaron, of course, was, uh, this tribe was preserved and they, their job was to take care of the spiritual needs of Israel. And so therefore he saying that Jesus is superior to that. Now, in chapter five, he, uh, in chapter six, he scolded the Jews for being immature and warned that Christ once received, it can, it, there's no backing out. There's no going back to the way it was. And so then we come to chapter seven and he then makes the argument that Jesus is superior to Judaism and to the priesthood and to Moses and the law by saying that, quoting a, a, a verse in Psalms, that Jesus was a prophet or a priest, a high priest, after the order of Melchizedek. Because Melchizedek was a, uh, was a king of Salem that was uh, a mysterious picture in the Old Testament that Abraham actually gave tithes to when he rescued Lot from the, from the raiders of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so therefore Jesus, then, then the writer makes the argument that since uh, Abraham, who was superior to all the, the Aaronic uh, and all the, the law and, and the, the, the religious activities, since he was the, the base of it, then uh, he was superior, that Jesus then would be superior if he was after the order of Melchizedek. And so Melchizedek, therefore, is superior to the Aaronic priesthood, and therefore Jesus, being a, a descendant of that order, then makes him superior also. Chapter 8 summarizes that Jesus is the author of the new covenant and replaces the old covenant. Of course, covenant is an agreement that God makes with mankind. Chapter 9, the first covenant was given to symbolizing the coming of the Messiah. Uh, the chapter 10 uh, the failure of the old covenant and encouragement not to forsake Christ. And then of course, in the chapter 11, he defined faith as the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And so in the book of, uh, in, the, in chapter 11, he gives this, what we call the heroes of the faith. He gives a long list of people who lived by faith. Now the now, where he's going with this is to set the, set the stage for today's uh, study. Today, we're going to see that the people, and we're going to see that this, that, uh, that this faith, and 
we, we actually have this relationship with Christ through faith, and he is making the statement in chapter 11, here are all the different people in, in the Old Testament that uh, followed God by faith. And so the argument here is that faith is not a new concept. And so therefore he begins to list the number of people. And so, and, and I'm not gonna recount the whole chapter, but we do need to look at all the different things. I'm apologizing because the, the introduction today may be a little longer than the, than the study itself, but uh, bear with me. He starts with Abel, and he talked about Abel, of course, who was the child of Adam and Eve, uh, firstborn son, and he offered, or the secondborn son, and he offered a more acceptable sacrifice. He offered, of course, the blood sacrifice and Cain made a sacrifice of the fruits of his labor. And so therefore God rejected uh, Cain's sacrifice and accepted Abel. And he makes a statement that Abel did this through faith. Enoch, of course, was an Old Testament character, the first one to be actually translated in the Bible. He went to heaven. And so he says, by faith, God took him to heaven. Then Noah, of course, came on the scene and he prepared an ark and he did this in a time when people had never seen rain. He was a way away from the ocean and so therefore nobody, uh, so Noah was a man of faith and so he saved all of mankind through faith. Abraham then, of course, sought a promised land from God and left his hometown and left his home and went off into the desert looking for a land that God had promised him. Sarah then, of course, bore a child in her old age, which was the seed of God's promise, which was the, the forerunner of the nation of Israel. Abraham then, of course, did not withhold Isaac from God and offered him as a sacrifice. Of course, God blocked that, that sacrifice. Then he talked about Isaac, blessed Jacob to be renamed Israel. And so he talks about the fact that, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, Isaac uh, did this by faith. Then he also comes along and he talks about Moses who forsook the, the pleasures of Egypt and, uh, and took up with a nation of slaves and laborers and delivered them from Pharaoh and by, actually was given the Passover and the 10 plagues and all of this was done by faith. And then Joshua, of course, was the head of victory at Jericho. He marched around the city and the walls fell down. And so Jer uh, Joshua it did all of this by faith. And also Rahab the harlot, who is mentioned there. Rahab is the one who entertained the spies when it came. When the walls fell, she was delivered. And so then she became a, a uh, accepted the, the Judaism and was actually named in the, the uh the, uh, the life, uh, I'm looking for the word, uh, was actually named in, the, uh, in the, the forerunner as a forerunner of Christ. And so uh, then we talked, about, then he's talked about Gideon, uh, who uh, defeated the Palestine army with only 300 men. He talked about Baark uh, in Judges 4, led the, the army of God to defeat the Canaanites. And then he talked about Jephthah, who sacrificed his daughter, whom he loved, and King David, who was a man after God's own heart. So these were all the different 13 people, I believe it is, 14, uh, that are listed as in the Hall of Faith. Now, why did he talk about this? And so we talk about this, and we go to chapter 12, and we're going to see here that this is the reason why he called this out. The problem we have as a Christian sometimes is we, we are saved and then we, we decide that we want to do something in our secular life and then we want to keep our Christian life separate. God never had any, had any intention of doing this. Now I know that today that the church is divided up in between laymen and preachers and I want to say to you I don't really believe there's a difference between a layman and a preacher. We're all called to be a service to God. And so what are we to do with this, this calling that God has given us? And he talks about this, that, and he's talking about these Jewish people who are going back and are tempted to go back to their old way of life. And he's calling them to now be a part of this, uh, 
uh, of this new faith, this church. It's not a new faith, he's saying, but let's go forward with the church. Don't forsake the church. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. Together, don't lose these things. Let's keep going. So he says then, and he, and, and he approaches chapter 12 with this encouragement. Chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we're also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that's set before us. He, Paul now, in, or the writer of Hebrews, I'm, I apologize, because we don't know for sure it was Paul. I'll show you next week, uh, next time we, we visit chapter 13, why I think it was Paul. I think there's a pretty clear statement at the end that it is Paul. But for, for those of you who are purists, we do not know exactly who he was, uh, who wrote the book. But what he's saying, he, he said, since we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, the, he gives the pictures of, the, of a great sports arena. There's these people all sitting in the stands around them, watching them from the past. There's uh, all of these people listed. Uh, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, all of these people are in the stands and all the different heroes of the faith in the Old Testament. He said, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses watching us, now he said, let us lay aside every weight and every sin that says those that uh, does so easily beset us. He said, don't get bogged down in life. Let's not, he said, the, the, the Bible teaches us that we're saved by grace through faith. We did no works to do that, but if we're going to serve him, then we need to get down to our fighting weight. We need to set aside every weight. When a, when a runner gets ready to enter a race, he, he, he kind of, he walks out onto the field and a great cloud of witnesses are looking up at him and he, he sheds off his upper clothes and he has a light apparel on. He has the best of footwear. He's all, uh, he's, uh, he's been up, he got in bed last night. He was very careful about what he ate. He is hydrated exactly perfectly. He's drinking his Gatorade and that's not a commercial, but he's drinking his, uh, his, uh, his, uh, uh, his, his liquids, he's keeping his body fit, he warms up carefully, he weighs, sets aside every weight and every sin that does, and he said, let's run the race with patience. He's saying to these Jewish Christians, let's run, don't get discouraged. And he said, now then, of course, in keeping this same race Picture in chapter two, in verse two, chapter 12, verse two, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of, of the throne of God. So he's talking about then that, uh, that the runner in the blocks, when he's getting ready to start, he has one thought in mind. He's not thinking about his girlfriend up in the sta stairs uh, uh, or his or her boyfriend up in the stairs watching, up in the, in the stands. He's not thinking about anything like that. He's not thinking about how tired he is. He's, he's done the best that he can to prepare for this race. He's in the starting blocks and he's got Jesus as an example. And Paul says, or the writer says in this book, this is what a Christian ought to be like. What a Christian life. Now, now realize we're not talking about preachers and, and, and Sunday school teachers. We're talking about everyday, everyday Christians, people who run in this life. He said, it's a race, it's a war. Verse three, he said, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. He said, keep Jesus as an example in your mind. Because when you get tired, if you think about how tired Jesus got uh, wagging that cross to, the, to, the, to Golgotha, he, then you'll have new energy. He said, keep your mind right. Keep yourself focused upon Jesus, who is as, uh, as, our, uh, as our focal point. He said, also, you got to realize that ye have not resisted unto blood striving against sin. He said... Bear in mind that as we run in this race that in front of this great cloud of witnesses, we're prepared, we're focused, and, and keep in mind that we're not as bad off 
as, uh, as some have, uh, as sometimes we like to think. When, when we get into a trial in our Christian life, what happens is we think that we're the only person who has ever been there. There's not one person that, well, not one thing that you're going through right now that somebody else hadn't gone through as well. And Jesus suffered all things. And so therefore what he's telling us, he says, don't, don't forget and, and don't feel sorry for yourself. Prepare yourself to Jesus because you've not gone through that. Verse five. And you've forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children, my son. Despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you're rebuked of him. Now, sometimes we get in the, in the, in the rink and the coach comes up to us and says, you did not perform well. And so therefore, we're going we're gonna to change things. We're, gonna, we're going to, to, uh, to you're going to have to run extra laps. I remember playing baseball as a, as a child. We would, uh, we would, after the end, if we did not play exactly right, then our coach would run us around the field, making us drag our feet in the grass so that we would get tired. And so then I got on my bicycle and rode three miles home. But <clears throat> nonetheless, <clears throat> he says, you've got to understand that if you're involved in the thing that, that you're going to be chastened. And so chastening is not for your punishment, but chastening is to prepare you for the hardships that we're going to come. I think a lot of times we, we, we think that, well, God, something happened to us. What did I do wrong? Well, it's not the matter of what you did wrong. It's a matter of what did we do right and what did we have that God wants to perfect. Chastening or punishment, if you will, or spanking or whatever it is or extra workouts or whatever is not for the purpose of discouraging us, but for the purpose of making us stronger. Uh, chapter six, he says, for the whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, or he, he disciplines and scourges every son as he receiveth. In the verse seven, uh, if, if, you, if you endure chastening, God dealing with us as sons, for what son is he who the father chasteneth not? So what he's saying here is that we, in, in, in our life, we come to a point where God is, is, is conditioning us and when we do get into tight things and when God chastens, and by the way, God will never chasten anybody without telling you. Somebody will come up to you and say, well, I see that you're suffering. What did you do that was wrong? Well, maybe you did nothing wrong. Maybe God's just trying to use the circumstance that you're going through to make you a little tougher and to make you run a little harder and give, get, you, get your fighting weight down and get you more involved because this chasing, chastening is a sign that God loves us. And if we are not chastened of the Lord because God chastens uh, a son that he loves, then the Bible tells us then, then uh, it's a sign of love. So if, you're, if, you're, if, you lo if God loves you and you need improving, then God's going to use chastening our, our conditions or hardships or whatever he, he sends into your life as an effort to keep you in shape and keep me in shape, keep us in shape. Then verse eight, but if it be without chastisement, where with, where all, all are partakers, then you're bastards and not sons. And so what he's saying is that if we are truly saved, if we truly love Christ, we truly have the Holy Spirit within us and we, we're not chastened when we, when we go awry or we're not chastened, then the Bible tells us that God doesn't love us and our faith is not legitimate. And he says that we're bastards. We claim to be uh, uh, saved, but we're not. And so what he's saying here is that look upon the, any kind of hardships or troubles that you see Realize that God is using that to condition you to make you and me a better Christian. We all have problems and we all, nothing, life doesn't go well for anybody. And so uh, it, even the, the happiest among us and the healthiest among us are all going to undergo things that cause us grief. So he says, but it, without chastening, he says, 
Verse seven, for what son is, is he whom the father chasteneth not? He said, if you be without chastisement, where all are you partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. God only spanks his own children. Uh, God only corrects his own children. I can be walking down through a store in the middle of a, of a department store and seeing this, this child who is giving their mother fits. And as bad as I would like to step in and, and, make, a, and make a change, as bad as I would like to step in and correct things, I can't because that, that, that's, that child that's misbehaving is not my child, it's somebody else's child, and therefore I have no authority to, to discipline or correct that child. Uh, now then, verse 10, for verily for a few days, chastening for they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure. Let's look back up. Verse nine. Furthermore, we have fathers of our flesh, our earthly fathers, which correcteth us. And we give them reverence and shall we not much more rather be in subjection to the, to the father, the spirits and live for they verily are a few days. He's talking about our earthly fathers for a few days, chasten us at their own pleasure but he for our profit that we may be partakers of holiness. Don't let problems rob us of our spiritual victory. That's what he's saying. Don't let these situations give us a problem. Don't quit. Don't quit. Keep on going. Verse 11. Now no chastening for the present seemed to be joyous, but grievous nevertheless after it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up holy hands which hang down and feeble knees. Don't get discouraged. I remember he said things don't, uh, uh, correction is not pleasant. It doesn't matter whether it's in school, it doesn't matter whether it's on the job, it doesn't matter if it's in life. Nobody enjoys, it's not a pleasurable thing. Nobody goes out and said, let's see how much chastening I can take today. What it is, though, it's given to us by our, for our own encouragement and correction. And then in verse 11, it says, uh, uh, let's see. Now, in verse 11, it says, verse 12, it said, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and feeble knees. He said, don't get your, don't go around drooping down and don't go around and quitting what you've started. Keep your eye on the goal. Keep your, your fighting weight up. Keep yourself conditioned, keep your eye on Jesus, keep your eye on the finish line, and don't get discouraged and quit. That's what he's saying. Verse 13, and make straight the paths for your feet, lest which is lame be turned out of the way, but let them rather be healed. Now, <clears throat> make straight paths. That doesn't mean a lot to us in this day and time. But in that particular day and time, when a king would travel from one area to another, they would make his path straight. They did not have roads like uh, we have uh, at that particular time. The Romans built roads. But a lot of times from, from old, older cultures, the king would go from point A to point B. Well, there would be valleys and streams and whatever. And so the workforce would go out and soldiers would go out the way and make his path straight. They would cut down trees, they would cut down things, they would bridge streams, they would smooth out the, the, the rough places so that the king would, would have a straight path and an easy path to go. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, let's do this for us. Keep your eye on the goal, keep your fighting weight down, keep, keep away from sin because sin's not gonna take you to hell, but it will rob you of, the, of, the, of stamina don't get, get discouraged because we're, you're undergoing trials. Don't get discouraged and quit and make your path as easily, as easy as you possible. Then verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It's very difficult to serve God and fight with your neighbor. So therefore, get along with your neighbor. I need to learn to do that. We all need to learn to do that. We all have conflicts. He says, uh, follow peace with all men and holiness. Be, keep yourself separate and pure. Don't become entangled with other arguments with, with other people, other church members especially. Don't be ar involved in arguments with, with other people. But uh, 
but follow peace and, and keep yourself separate which no man uh, which no man shall see without which no man will see the lord he says this is important looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of god lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby be defiled lest now we'll stop there for a minute and let's talk a little bit about bitterness and i don't have a lot of time to to dwell on this because i have actually taught entire lessons on bitterness uh, my definition of bitterness is pickled anger. When we become angry, it's very important for us to get over that anger. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what we have to do to do it. But sometimes you can't, uh, you can't do something about somebody else. But in our own heart, we've got to deal with this anger. If we don't, the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. And of course, the old joke that was then that my wife and I decided that we were never going to let the sun go down on our anger. And so we've been awake now for six months. No, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, that's uh, don't go to bed without with, with anger in your heart. What he's saying is deal with this thing because bitterness will destroy you. He's talking about those things that uh, that will keep you from being effective for God. Now then. Verse 16, he starts talking about sin. A lot of times Christians don't want to talk about sin. We, it's not a very popular subject this day and time. You say, well, we're forgiven by grace. And so therefore, there. but what he's talking about here is that sin actually loses and actually robs us from being effective for God. And also, if it's not dealt with, a lot of sins will literally take us on to heaven to be with God early. Uh, lest any, verse 16, lest any be in fornication or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how afterward that he would have inherited the blessing. He was rejected for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He uses here Esau as an example. He says, don't let this bitterness and don't let this sin, this fornication, this sexual impurity, this entanglement with, with, with other things in the world. It could be gambling. It could be all these different things that is going to sap your strength and sap your spiritual life. If we're not careful, he said, don't get involved in those things. Keep yourself pure from them. <clears throat> then he talks about then verse 18, for you're not coming to the mount that it might be touched and burned with fire and or blackness or darkness and tempest. And the sound of the trumpet and the voice of the words, which voice that you heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as the beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned and thrust through with a dart. And so the terrible, and so terrible was the sight that Moses said, "I exceedingly fear the quake." Now the reference here is made. To, and when Moses went up on the Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments, the, the, the Lord first of them out of a cloud spoke them to the children of Israel. And when God descended into the mountain, God is a pure God and God is a holy God. And he uses this example, even though we're saved by grace, we cannot lose the reverence and respect that we have for the holiness of God. And he said, don't get involved in these things and don't get get entangled with things that's going to displease God. Moses, the people had to clean, they had to fast uh, they, uh, and get their lives right. They had to be pure, they couldn't touch the mountain. Now, of course, we the, the, the writer spent all this time talking about how Jesus has replaced all that, but he's saying that, look, God is still God, no matter if Jesus has replaced this or not. Verse 21, uh, and verse 22. But we were come to Mount Sion and to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, and innumerably the company of angels, to the gen to general assembly of the, of the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and the spirits of all just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator and the new covenant, and the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that you refuse not him that speak, for we shall, for if they escape, not who refused him that spake on the earth, much more shall we 
shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. He said, even though we have Jesus as our finisher, as our savior, we're still not immune from the holiness of God. We must respect it. Don't get discouraged, but don't get entangled with this world because this world doesn't have much respect for God. But the day is coming when it will. But if we have entangled ourselves with this worldly lifestyle and you say, oh, here we go. I've heard this my whole life. What I'm saying is this worldly lifestyle will not send you to hell because Jesus paid for that. But what it will do is it'll rob you of your power with God and make your ministry of none effect. Verse 26 whose voice then shook the earth, but now hath promised saying, yet once more, I, I shake not the earth, but also heaven. And this is the word, yet one more signifies the removeth of things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that are things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore we receive the kingdom that cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptedly with the reverence and godly fear for God is a consuming fire. The only thing that, ki that spares us from God's consuming fire, of course, is our relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus is the author. He's the finisher. He's our example. He is our encourager. And it's our job to in front of this great cloud of witnesses that we've given not to become entangled with the world keep ourselves pure and holy and separate from the world, but to run this race that God has left it for us. Now, it's not a very popular message in this day and time, but God is, expects us to be different. He expects us to run our race well, and, he's, and, and it's our job. Now, this is, of course, the conclusion, basically, of the book. Next week is what I call the salutation. It's the parting credits of the book, or the next time we study this, it's the parting credits of the book. And he, there are some very good things. In one particular verse, he, he talks about not entertaining angels unaware. We're going to talk about that. And so let's look forward to this and let's, let's, uh, let's keep ourselves in good fighting form so that we can serve God. Thank you very much for being with us today. I want to say thanks to our pastor, Brother Dusty Ray, and our producer, who's Brother Sam Ray, of this particular series. I hope that you come visit us at Heartland Baptist Church in Murfreesboro uh, and uh, be a part of our service here. We're opening up now uh, after the pandemic, and so it looks like that, uh, uh, God willing, that this is behind us, or, or for the most part, will be behind us in a few more in a few more days. Thank you so much for being with us. Pray for us when you think about us, and we'll see you. Thank you.